So I see people are um, slowly filtering in here. Um, I'm going to get started. My name is Amy Winter. I'm a board member. Thanks, Jan, um, for the comments for Neighborhood Council. I'm filling in for Cynthia, who can't be here today. And then um, Erica, um, our vice president, is also going to be joining me shortly. So um, I think the first item in our agenda tonight is um, police reports from B3 and C11. Um, I see B3 is here. So can I pass it off to you? Okay, so for the month you had 14 things that occurred. And why is this not responding to me? Oh, here we go. Seven are titled all other offenses. There was one larceny of other things. There was a auto parts larceny, a motor vehicle theft, a missing person, or two missing persons actually. One simple assault, which is a domestic. We won't get into that too much. And then one vandalism. So that's pretty much the report for the month for your area. Um, what I would tell you all to do or be on the watch for if you're getting packages delivered, be careful with that. There are a lot of what they call them, porch pirates that they wait for Amazon or whoever to deliver and they come and grab them. Don't leave valuables in your car that are in plain sight. Um, we are raising or gathering toys for the kids in the area for different families that are in need. If you all would like to donate toys, just let us know, we'll come and pick them up. And that is pretty much it that we have for our B3. Or if you know any children in need, let us know that too, please. Great, thank you. Any questions for B3? Okay, if not, I, I'm not seeing C11, but is someone from C11 here? I don't recognize any of the names from C11. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> so, yeah, okay, so we'll we'll come back. I'll check maybe later to see if anyone logs in. Um, in the meantime, I'll go to the next item in our agenda, which is our uh, 2021 recap. So let me um, share my screen here. Can everyone see this? Yeah. Great, okay. So this is our um, chronological year review here. So we can highlight some of the activities that uh, we've been working on. Uh, this is a sad image because it's the last time we were all in person. Feels like forever ago, but we've been meeting virtually for um, more than a year and a half now. So last, last March was the last in-person meeting, but we still have been meeting every month. We haven't missed a month since um, COVID. So it's been, uh, great to see the um, energy still kept up with the neighborhood council. Uh, back in January, we helped organize um, a CPR training. That was one of the first events that we held virtually. Um, we also pivoted to um, continue the winter farmers market. Um, we were no longer able to do it in person as shown here when we were um, still at the, um, the health center but we have been doing it um, virtual. I actually just ordered from them again last week. It's, if anyone hasn't, they're wonderful and um, we really recommend supporting them. Um, but yes, yeah, so anyways, we're still offering that online. Um, this is a, a great photo. It shows um, part of our distribution um, during the height of the pandemic. We were doing up to 200 boxes of free food every week. Um, this is showing some of the people that made that happen by the um, tea station. Um, again, here's the um, information um, highlighting the Dorchester Winter Farmers Market. And uh, there's the website as well if people are interested in, in um, purchasing some items. We also were involved in PPE distribution um, in partnership with the mayor's office, the counselor's office, and then our very own Leonard Lee, who was a one-man show um, helping distribute uh, PPE. So. Um, I don't know if Leonard's on here tonight, but um, we really thank him for all of his efforts in the neighborhood. Um, we also continue to raise funding for the Cobbin Square Park um, at the corner of Talbot and Washington Street. Uh, Cynthia's been talking about this project for a long time and it really um, will start to rejuvenate that part of, of Washington and we're just so excited about it. As you can see, we already had um, $640,000 of capital dollars and we're waiting to hear about another 150. Um, we also had um, the um, city alerted us that we would start um, planning discussions again in the new year. So that's something to look forward to. 
Um, we were also part of um, leading several conversations with other um, local neighborhood associations. Um, most recently, uh, um, we met with the two cannabis dispensaries to help um, shepherd that conversation. Um, and there's much more to come on that. Mm -hmm. uh, we participated again in the Love Your Block um, cleanup this past summer. Um, here's a lot of the workers. That was a really fun, beautiful day right in um, the Dr. Lesh Park on Wainwright Street. Um, and um, we did, we were able to do the Cobb and Square Summer Market in person this year um, with safety precautions. Um, the Bold Teens did a wonderful job, especially um, the market manager as well, highlighting different um, events each within different themes um, each week. So we really enjoyed the farmer's market and it had a lot of success. Um, you can see about um, 80,000 um, in coupons. It's incredible. Mm. Um, and again, partnering with other uh, community organizations on um, other initiatives. And then just recently, we celebrated our Hidden Heroes and Sheroes event, which was um, a wonderful event to highlight some of these really important people who are volunteering in our community um, and also raise some um, money for um, some youth scholarships. And these are the two um, youth recipients on the right and then all of our awardees on the left. Um, we raised an incredible amount of money, even though it was again virtual this year, um, you know, we're hoping next year to get back in person and celebrate um, with a proper dinner and party format, but it was a great event, although we were not able to be together. And then um, just highlighting this event um, coming up actually this this coming weekend, um, we weren't able to do this last year so it's great that we're going to be lighting the tree again in person, so we hope that people um, will be attending that on Saturday. Okay, I think that's the end of my slides. So I am going to hand it over to um, Lisa to talk about our 2022 board elections. Thank you, Amy. Um, it's that time of year again um, where we nominate a new board for 2022. And basically, the, um, the Codman Square Neighborhood Council is made up of residents and community partners who want things to be good in Codman Square. Um, we band together and uh, work to make life, to improve life in and around Codman Square. There are 11 residents and 11 people who represent community partners. And um, I don't know if I'm able to share my screen or I could just read off the names. Um, let me see. Disabled. Okay, I'm not, I'm not able to do that, but I can just read off the names. And if you are present on the call, if you just raise your hand or just uh, let us know you're here. Um, so we have for board members, Cynthia Les Johnson, Amy Winter, who just spoke, Sean Burgess, Reverend Brilton Levy, Milton Bramble, Marie St. Louis, Richard Scott, Melissa Dagger, Christina Pru Pruitt, I apologize for not pronouncing that correctly, um, Erica Davis, and Vikma Dessier. Now for the affiliate members, we have Alphonse Knight, who represents the Second Church in Dorchester, Joanna Edwards, Thumbprint Cares, Myself, Lisa Hamblin, who represents the Codman Square Health Center, Marilyn Foreman, Codman Square Neighborhood Development Corporation, Jeffrey Johnson, Friends of, Dorche of Dr. Lesh Family Park, Antoine Brewster, Church Planting, Sharon McCormick, Habitat for Humanity, Greater Boston, Barbara Burgess, Burgess Realty Group, Leonard Lee, Melvin Park Neighborhood Association, Meg Campbell, Codman Academy Charter Public School, and Shamara Rhodes of Boston Got Next. So these are the, the nominations for the 2022 board. 
And at this time, I'd like to call a vote to vote these people in as the 2022 Codman Square Neighborhood Council Board. And I need one member of the board to vote and another to second. Also, Lisa, if you'd like mm -hmm. to try sharing again, I think I just enabled oh. it. Okay. Yes, I'm sorry about that. That's fine. Okay, are you guys able to see that? Okay. Yes. So this is the slate. And the names that I just read off. So barring any objections, I call for the vote for the 2022 Codman Square Neighborhood Council Board. Okay, do we have any takers? Um, Lisa, you said any board member could vote? A board member and a second. Well, I someone, as a board someone member, needs to you need oh. to nominate and then second. These, yeah. these are these are the nomination. These are the nominees. So, are the affiliate members able to to um, to uh, to kind of uh, put this on the floor before it's second? Or does it have yeah, to be like the 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 um the residents? The the residents, the full okay. the board members. All right. Okay. So from that top list, somebody needs mm -hmm. to um to approve or to put that on the floor and then yeah, everyone to nominate else. that slate. I think it's a the official name. Perfect. Someone yes. Yeah. Okay. i I would I'm like to nominate the slate. Okay, I'm hearing two of you. So was that was Melissa? Melissa? Yes. Okay. And now someone needs to second. Second. I second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Aye. Any objections? So the motion has passed. We have a new board for the 2022 calendar year. Thank you very much. Hey, congratulations. Thank you. All right, and I'm gonna stop sharing. Okay. Okay, um, thank you so much, Lisa. Erica, can I um, tip it over to you? Yes, thank you, Amy. Thank you. So next we will hear from someone from the Dorchester Food Co-op. Can we get an update? Is someone on a representative? Hi, I'm Mary Regan, a community organizer for the Dorchester Food Co-op. And Robin? Hi, hello. <laughs> so can we share um, if if I if we, I think me, if I can share screen? Yes, you should be able to go ahead and try. Okay, thanks. Let's see. Yes, yes, yes. Can you see that? Yeah. Okay. Wonderful. Mary, take it away. Okie dokie. So uh, we're uh, members of the Dorchester Food Co-op and a co-op is a business that's owned democratically controlled and financed by its members to meet their common needs. So when we polled uh, folks in Dorchester, uh, needs that we heard were that we need access to fresh, healthy food, we need to build the local economy, and we need to engage community members in that process. So the Dorchester Food Co-op, uh, we've been organizing for about 10 years now and we're building a community and worker owned asset to nurture, employ and reinvest in the local community. 
Um, and we have a little three minute video to share with you. Yes, I think I have to stop sharing on this to pull that one up. So give me one second. And then I have to share the other screen. Okay. Ah, do you, can you see the video? Yeah. Okay, great. I'm gonna hit play. The Dorchester Food Co-op is a grocery store that is owned by the community and the workers. We will lift up neighborhood voices to create a co-op that truly celebrates our diverse and vibrant community. Let's build an innovative public space committed to racial, economic, and worker justice. That will enhance the health and well-being of our community. Cooperation is our approach and justice is our goal. Cooperación es nuestro enfoque y la justicia es nuestra meta. Cooperación es nuestra presentación, justicia es nuestro objetivo. Cooperación se apoya nos, justicia se gol nos. Mancan hoptak boyao va comli la motivo chunda. Cooperation is our approach, justice is our goal. We have an opportunity to really uh, more profoundly embrace and engage the community in something that matters and food matters. Um, Mary, 20 plus local farms and food entrepreneurs. The, the video the is paused for folks. Yeah, oh. I was just uh, texting with Robin about that. Okay, I mean, <laughs> yeah. we can hear the audio clear if, if we need to just listen to that, but just wanted you oh. to know. I'll just keep playing it. I don't know why the video is paused, but um, you can also check it out on our YouTube, but I'll, can, I'll just keep press play, okay? Okay. Regional partners, more than 900 member owners and counting, the Dorchester Food Co-op is coming to 195 Bowdoin Street. Our full service grocery store will offer locally and sustainably sourced affordable food from fresh produce to bulk goods and beyond. It's a place to shop, learn and connect with your neighbors. If you become a member of the Dorchester Food Co-op, you're going to become an owner of a grocery store. The Dorchester Food Co-op's mission involves giving power back to the people. The community owns it, literally. The folks that work there are owners and folks that shop there can be owners. Everything that the co-op does is determined by the community and all of the surplus value that the store creates goes back to the community. The community got together and did this. So people in the neighborhood can build something that they own. To have something that is for us, where we can have access to healthy food and that it's being grown by the people who live in the community is to me what justice is all about. So it's all connected, economic justice, racial justice, um, and doing it in a community that often feels left behind. Something that our community deserves and it's something that uh, clearly the community is working to make it happen. Become a member, become an owner. Invest, donate, join at dorchesterfoodcoop.com. Well, sorry, I don't know why the video wasn't playing on your end. Um, hmm. Let me just um, bring up the presentation again. Yeah, and if you go to our website, dorchesterfoodcoop.com, you can see the beautiful people that are saying all those things in the video. <laughs> yeah, the, vid the video's on the website. That's strange. Um, that's yeah. never happened before. <laughs> Um, but when you do watch the video, if you go to the website, everybody that's in the video is a Dorchester Food Co-op member owner. Um, and let's see, I'm going to go to the next page. Hold on. So currently we have 1,139 member owners. We got one more member owner since this afternoon. <laughs> um, and, and I think um, actually with the folks that are here on this Zoom with us, I, I know I recognize a few. Marilyn is a Dorchester Food Co-op member, uh, Representative Holmes, Janice, 
just joined Saturday and actually since Saturday, Janice, 10 people have joined since you, um, since Saturday. Um, so we have a goal of reaching um, 1,200 new member owners by the end of December. Um, we've Mary, who's here with on the call with us is um, our new community organizer. She's our only staff person. Um, we have worked at developing something called a membership for all program, um, which we'll have more information when we roll it out, but that's for um, folks that would like to become a member. If the, um, if the, the membership price is prohibitive, we have a program to help with the, um, the, the cost of membership. Um, this past summer, we tabled at uh, five different uh, summer's markets, uh, Codman Square being one of them on Saturdays, as well as Ashmont Station, Mattapan Square, uh, the Dudley Commons and Roslindale Square markets. This winter market, we hope to be at, with Codman Square this winter as well. And also we're every Thursday in the Dudley Greenhouse for that market currently. Uh, Mary? And you probably have seen the store being built right down the street. Uh, Viet Aid is the developer. They're building 48 units of affordable housing on the upper floors, and our floor will be on the ground floor. Um, Co Everything is our architect and designer, um, and we've hired a construction contractor. Um, I learned that when you're renting commercial space, you have to actually design and put in the lighting and the flooring. It's like, it's, a, it's different than renting um, housing. We are looking for a general manager. So if you know somebody uh, who would be a good general manager, please send them to us. Um, to give you an idea of some upcoming um programs that we're working on. We did a virtual screening um, in the month of October. Yeah, no, November. <laughs> um, and we'll be doing another screening in a couple of weeks, the Food Chain documentary. Um, we'll have more information on our Linktree page for that. Uh, also Thursdays, we are in the Dudley Greenhouse, as I mentioned, at 11 Brook Ave in Roxbury. It's open to the public from 2.30 to 5.30 every Thursday. And uh, as, as we said at the beginning, um, a co-op is a community, a, a, a group of members, and we need new members. Uh, we're 1,139 strong already. Um, we are being challenged to uh, get funding to build out the store in the in the next couple of months, and we want to get to 1,200 by the end of this month. Um, there's a part for everybody to play in building this food justice movement. So please join us if you haven't already, and if you already are a member, please tell your friends, neighbors, family members. Anybody? Yes. And so the question is, how do you join or how do you become a member? And what are the benefits of membership? Um, we can give you just a brief idea here. Uh, it's very easy to become a member. It's a one-time, one, you know, a lifetime fee of $100. You can pay all at once or in installments starting with $25 and then pay over the year. Um, and we are also creating the membership for all program, which would be um, paying the $25 first installment, and then that um, the fund would cover the remaining balance um, for folks. Also, the benefits of membership, it's very similar to other co-ops. Um, you, uh, you have a say, basically you have a vote in any votable <laughs> any votable, any votable decision. So you could vote um, for the board members just like you all voted tonight. Um, and you also can run to be part of the board or a board member, um, as well as when the store is open, we will have member owner discounts um, and things like um, discounts on bulk items or other, other whatever we decide, we'll figure it out. Um, and also you'd be part of a community that's supporting local farmers, producers, and vendors, and you'll be building community and 
food security for all. Uh, once the store is open, it's anybody can shop there. You don't have to be a member to shop there, but everyone is welcome to become a member. And for more information, <clears throat> you could go to our link tree, which is link tree slash Dorchester Food Co-op or, do, or the website, dorchesterfoodcoop.com. And um, I'm gonna stop sharing and wonder if anyone had any questions or, um, yeah. Can you drop the link to the YouTube video in the chat, please? Yeah, I will put, I'm gonna put in the link tree. And when you go to the link tree, everything about Dorchester Food Co-op is on our link tree. And one of the, when you scroll all the way down, you'll see the YouTube link on our link tree. Uh, Does anybody else have any additional questions? I just wanted to ask, um, I think it said stores plan to open in 2022. Do you know yeah. around when in 2022, early, late? Well, it wouldn't be early. <laughs> that would be... <laughs> That would be next month. <laughs> so I'd say about, um, so currently, actually we're doing a site visit tomorrow um, and we will see the, the inside. So right now they're building the building, the frame. Um, when they continue building the, the, the second and up to the fourth floors, our part on the first floor, it will just be the walls and the floor. So we have to go in and build out the store. They call that the store build out. Um, so hoping we're hoping to get in there like January, February, and then it takes, you know, usually eight, nine months or so. So we're hoping next year, this time that the store will be ready for shopping. Great, thank you. <laughs> Do you mind explaining some of the financial pieces? I mean, we put in the hundred grand, but then the money, the rest of the money has been raised out. Yes, I'm, yes. Do you mind um, explaining that? Sure, I would go to the website. Um, so the money is raised when you go, if you go to the link tree, we have a FAQ, frequently asked questions. And that's one of the questions, like how is the money raised for the store? Um, it's raised through member equity. So when you join your $100 is part of the funding, then we will also have um, uh, grants and also a capital campaign, which we're currently in. It, the store is going to cost $3 million to build out the store. We're more than halfway. We've raised more than half of that. Um, also, if you go to the link tree, you'll see a link that says you look like you're up for a challenge. If you click that, <laughs> it explains one of, um, one of our loans. Um, one of our loans, they're, they're offering us a loan. However, it's a loan for $500,000 but we have to raise $600,000 and get a hundred new members, hopefully before the end of, by the end of this month, uh, before they'll release the first payment. So that's why we're really eager for you all to join. Everybody that's here tonight, we'd love for you to join tonight because we gotta get that loan. Without the loan, we can't build the store. So yes, we are on a push for getting new members, obviously. Um, and again, without members, there really is no community and it's all about building community and the needs of the community. And- um, So thank you for saying that because I want to make sure other people heard why we're trying to get another hundred people. So- Absolutely. Sign my mom up, she's on the list somewhere on this. She's on this call, Marilyn Stout. She'll, she'll either send oh, you a hundred dollars yeah. or I'll send you a hundred dollars, one of us will. Very nice, thank you. <laughs> Great, and, thank and, you. And state rep, rep is number, he's member number 334. So he's been in it for a long time. He's been pushing for this, advocating for this store to happen for a long time. Marilyn has been with us for almost nine years. She's member number 77. Um, who else? Like I said, Janice Knight, she just joined Saturday. She's member 1,129. And since Saturday, we've had 10 new members. So we'd love to welcome everyone that's, oh, Alphonse is on the call. He's also, um, a member. Um, so we'd love to welcome everybody that's here to also join. So 
My name is Marilyn Stout. You're talking about Marilyn Foreman. Yes. So I'm Russell's mother. So he's telling you <laughs> to sign me up tonight. <laughs> well, you so have to. You have full agreement with him to sign yes. up tonight. <laughs> So you and Russell can get together and actually you can join very easily on our website. Um, and if you have any problems with that, you're welcome to call. You can call me or call or email. We can help you walk through that. I'm sure we'll have no problem. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions? No, so we'll now hear from Marilyn Foreman. She'll speak about the common square tree lighting. Okay, yeah. So um, last year, I don't think that we had one. The, the tree was lit, but there were no people. There was no community there. So um, this sat, no, yeah, it is this Saturday, December the 4th uh, at 1 p.m. at the Codman Commons or the Codman Park um, and Codman, Codman Square Park. We will be having that tree lighting um, and the trolley tour. So the trolley will be coming along in the daytime. You know, there, there will be COVID restrictions um, that would apply. So no children can sit on Santa's laps to take pictures. Maybe they can stand six feet apart from him and take a picture. I don't know how that would work, but yeah. So um, Santa will be there. Maybe there's a little entourage and what have you. We'll have like goodies there. Um, we might even have a Santa that looks like us. So we'll have two, um, they're, they're twins, but they just look a little different. One's vanilla, one's chocolate, but um, you know, it will be, it's gonna be so exciting, so much fun, all these goodies. And just to see the, the tree lit up, just to see people out in Codman Square. Um, so that's one o'clock on Saturday. Um, we encourage you to bring uh, your family, but especially the kids. Um, so we hope to have like all of these goodies and um, want to take some memorable pictures. Um, and if anyone has information that they want to share, bring it along and we can throw it in a bag like they're trick-or-treating or something. But, um, you know, there's a lot of good stuff coming up. A lot of opportunity for many community members to be involved. We're at the top of starting a new world all over again. And so let's shape it. Let's make it however we want it to look. But, you know, for the holiday, let's bring some joy into Codman Square. When those lights go on, we want to shout to the angels and thank God for it and all of those that are able to gather at that site. Um, so that, again, is going to be this Saturday, December 4th at 1 p.m. Um, that's the lighting, but we want everyone to try and come out by like 12.30. If you could be out at about 12.30, um, you might get the good cookie. So don't wait till one o'clock, come there at 12.30. <laughs> and then, um, you know, we'll start the festivities. There'll be a DJ there. Um, so we're gonna, we're gonna rock the park. So come on out Saturday, 12.30, Codman Square, bring the family, the kids, and let's do this. Questions, comments? Hey, Marilyn, one time I was there and we had some very good hot cocoa. We are, we're gonna have some, if not, wherever we got it, I'll pay for it. And that was a good thing to have cocoa there one, one year we did it. So yeah. do you know who we did it that year? I forget who did it. I think it was Dunkin' Donuts actually. I okay, so you're saying just pick it up from them. You think they have it? Yeah, um, they had it in, uh, uh, the, the Ashmont, we had gotten it from there. And and I know that, yeah, we did. That's where we got it from. Okay, I'll grab that. Okay. Awesome. I'll bring some. Thank you, Rep Holmes. That's why we love you so much. You're always coming through for us. Thank you. Thank you. Now we will hand it off to the Fairmont Indigo CDC Collaborative. Is Kendra on? Or if not, yes. is someone else on? I'm here. Thanks okay. so much. Yep. Um, I'm going to share my screen as well. Can everyone see that all right? Yep. Yes. Great. Well, thanks so much for having me and allowing me to speak. I just wanted to talk a bit about um, my organization is the Fairmount Indigo CDC Collaborative and the work we're doing and invite um, anyone from the Neighborhood Council to join us. 
Um, so we are an umbrella group of three Boston CDCs, one of which is the Codman Square NDC. The other two are the Dorchester Bay Economic Development Corporation in Upham's Corner area and the Southwest Boston Community Development Corporation, which encompasses Hyde Park and Roslindale. Um, so the collaborative is currently focusing on a climate justice and health equity um, project. And our goals are to bring together coalitions of community members to advocate for policy change um, with the more specific goals of supporting the community to build this collective political power, fight for climate justice, resilience, and health equity. Um, we hope to connect local residents to skill building and job opportunities for sustainable and well-paying employment. The CDCs also develop affordable housing without displacement. Um, and we work to protect and create green spaces and promote transit equity. Um, and I just wanted to invite everyone to join us specifically. Um, you can always just reach out to me here uh, at this email or phone number and we can chat maybe about anything you're interested in um, regarding our work or any ideas you may have, but there's also a more specific opportunity that um, Codman Square NDC has, um, which is the Codman Square Climate Justice Alliance group, um, which also has a people of color affinity group, which kind of guides the, the entire alliance in their work. Um, we meet every six-ish weeks, um, and it's a space for community members, particularly in Codman Square, but also elsewhere, um, to voice their climate and health concerns and ideas as to how we can improve our environment and communities. Um, and in those sessions, we work together to advocate for such change. So just wanted to put that opportunity out there for everyone and let you know that uh, we would love for you to join us or uh, feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions or interest in this work. Thanks so much. Can I ask a question of Kendra, yeah. please? Kendra, why is climate justice so important? <laughs> Great question. <laughs> um, climate justice is particularly important uh, to the collaborative because it's our communities here in Dorchester and Hyde Park um, who are being hit hardest um, and disproportionately by the effects of climate change, be that extreme heat, um, or other weather circumstances like um, flooding issues or inappropriate infrastructure for rain and other precipitation. Um, additionally, some more, uh, not necessarily climate affiliated, but certainly environmental affiliated issues like increased air pollution um, affects our neighborhoods as well. And uh, climate justice um, is an intersectional approach to addressing the climate crisis in that um, we seek also racial and economic justice in this work. Um, and, and we know that uh, our communities are experiencing this and we seek for them to um, no longer do so and come together so that we can have a healthier, more vibrant place to live and work and play. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Marilyn, you're up again. You're going to you please recap Hidden Heroes. Tell us <laughs> how much money we raise. Oh. Let us know if everything I'm sold sorry, can, auction. Can I ask a question? Yeah, go ahead. Why is it called Indigo? So what, what is this? Well, what is the Indigo line? Yeah, um, our organization is called the Fairmount Indigo CDC Collaborative because the communities we serve are those that are adjacent or abutting the commuter rail line, which is called the Fairmount Indigo Line. So it's in those areas that we focus our work. And it brings all the CDCs that are in our group together as well, and that our communities are connected by this rail line. Thank you so much. Okay, so um, was everyone on this call at the Hidden Heroes event? Yes, 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 right? Yeah, it was super duper fabulous, right? Um, 
you know, it's not like years past where we would uh, sit and break bread together and enjoy music and, and all of that and, you know, admire, uh, you know, all of what we see before us, the decorations and everything. However, it was still really nice, always exciting to um, expose the hidden heroes and to thank them for the yeoman's work that they do in the community without expecting any um, acknowledgement or recognition for the work they do. They do it because it's from the heart. They do it because they care and they, they, they just love community and being a part of it. So they give back. And so the Hidden Heroes Committee and people like yourselves nominate those people that they see in the community doing that work. And we have the celebration to recognize them um, and to show our appreciation by having people like um, Rep Holmes and the mayor and everyone give them certificates or um, of appreciation as well. Um, it also served as a, um, a fundraiser that would be responsible for um, allowing for two high school seniors to receive $1,500 scholarships um, for their continuing education. Um, that newly established name for the scholarship fund was uh, given after the Reverend Dr. Bill Lesh, um, who was an avid um, um, supporter of, of youth. Um, and helping them to move forward and always encouraging them and giving them the tools that they needed to start their road on to success. So we just want to thank everyone on behalf of the committee who supported the event either by purchasing an ad, by uh, participating in our silent auction, which was really, well, it wasn't silent, it was an online auction, but it was so much fun. We had an auction a couple of years ago at our last live event. It was a little different. And then this one was a little bit different, but I mean, you know, that's it, the spice of life, right? It's always something different. So with the silent auction, um, we were able to, to raise close to $2,000 with that, I keep saying silent, with the online auction. Um, we had some wonderful um, gifts um, and prizes, and I see some of the winners here. Um, always taking donations because we, we'd like to have more kids, more recipients of those scholarships. Um, there were people who actually sponsored scholarships. So they were donating scholarship funds so that we don't have to work so hard, but we're gonna work hard because we want to give more scholarships. But there were, I think at least four or five donors um, who are going to sponsor scholarships for the next couple years. So let's give them a round of applause to show our appreciation because that is so wonderful um, that people in the community really invest in our young people. Um, so that is always a wonderful thing. Um, and when you see our, our hidden heroes and sheroes, make sure that you congratulate them. And then if you see folks in the community that are doing this type of work, that you nominate them for next year's hidden heroes. I think that um, I read that we have like over 200 um, heroes since, 1987 that have been nominated um, that are walking around among us and and what have you so there's lots of hidden heroes and sheroes among us um, and we want to continue that trend uh, we want to continue to build community together and we want to continue to encourage our young people and support them with the continue continuing education goals so on behalf of the Hidden Heroes and Sheryls Committee and the Codman Square Neighborhood Council. I would like to say thank you, thank you, thank you so very much for everybody, all your participation and for all that you do in the community as well. So let's just keep on keeping on and looking forward to like even a greater one next year when we can all gather together. Did I forget anything? No, I, I really, think you summed it up really well. 
Yeah, so I'm not sure like what what the what the total numbers were actually for the, you know, with the with the ads and and then some of the just donations that came in. All I know is that our scholarship for the scholarship fund and the money that we raised from the auction yielded just under $2,000. Nice. Was that more than last year? Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, actually, you know what? It was actually more than that because like I said, we got, we got uh, another maybe 3,000, close to $3,000 in uh, scholarship um, donations. So for all of those who um, sponsored those scholarships, that, that's money coming in towards those scholarships. And that's what that, the online auction was to support as well. So this is, a, this is a wonderful thing. Thank you again for the donors who donated um, items and for those who bought ads and for those who prayed and all of those who just believe in the work that all of these wonderful people in Codman Square do. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Marilyn. Now we will hear from Cole Hung and he will speak about the Community Land Trust Ambassador Program. Hi, hello everyone. Um, I'm Cole and I use they, them pronouns and I am the community organizer at uh, BNCLT, which is the Boston Neighborhood Community Land Trust. Um, so I'm just gonna give a a very brief like description of our organization for those who aren't familiar. Um, I'm going to mention the Community Land Trust Ambassador Program, which um, is our educational workshops about CLTs, um, Community Land Trusts. And also I have a, a survey that we are doing a survey to the community just to collect information about housing, um, your experiences of housing in the Dorchester, Mattapan, Roxbury area, which is like the Fairmount Corridor, kind of the heart of where we serve. And in the survey, um, I'm, I'm looking for like some input about housing um, issues that we're experiencing in the communities and also um, about the strate strategy of our organization for the upcoming years, like what uh, we should focus on. So I'll just start by uh, explaining about the BNCLT. Um, we are an organization that does affordable housing, but we're a very particular model. Um, we have a land trust and the properties are all preserved as permanently affordable housing on our land trust. Also, we have a community controlled model where uh, residents are leading the organization on the board and are part of um, collective governance. So it's really um, not that the uh, housing is owned by the BNCLT, but the residents are the organization, the community members such as yourselves are the organization and collectively we're owning this housing together. So it's, um, it's a really exciting model. I would love to talk more to you all about this model. So um, I wanted to invite folks to consider being a part of our CLT ambassador program. Um, and this program is going to be for current and prospective CLT residents, but also community members who wanna be part of this um, movement towards justice. I think we are, uh, towards this community land trust movement, we're in this stage of getting kind of broader and expanding our base. And so that's why I reached out to you all. Um, I'm getting the sense this is a really great group. I'm grateful that you all invited me here today and getting to hear about Dorchester Food Co-op and the Fairmore Corridor Collaborative has been really great. Um, so yeah, I actually don't have the dates and times decided for the ambassador program yet, but I want to 
collect the names of uh, people who are interested in this. Um, the first lesson would be to learn about kind of Community Land Trust 101, a rundown of what a CLT is and how the model could work for rental housing and also home ownership. And then um, we're also teaching about the movement and history of CLTs in the US. And we're going to do a lesson on collective governance where um, the residents and other participants in the program get to um, kind of embody a board meeting and learn about what it would be like to serve on a CLT board. Um, so I quickly made a form because I didn't have the um, the dates yet correct on the other form. So the, I'm just gonna drop this in the chat. Well, first of all, here's my contact information. Um, and then CLT ambassador interest would be this form. Um, just collecting your name and I will get in touch with you. Um, but the next thing that I wanted to share is this survey to the community. Um, so I will copy the link for that and put it in the chat as well. And I wanna give people five, the next five minutes just to answer these um, questions. It's actually a Google form survey with 12 questions. Um, and this is what we were looking to um, to give people an opportunity to uh, answer these questions and maybe as, um, as you fill that out, can you let me know if you have any questions about this? Um, I'm also happy to follow up and send this by email if you want to put your contact info in the chat, um, but hopefully the link should work. As people are filling out, the survey, for the sake of time, I'm going to, do you have anything else you wanna share, Cole? Um, thanks, Erica. Yeah, I think that's it. Um, so yeah, feel free to just uh, answer the survey or fill out the form, the interest form if you wanna be in touch with me in any way and I'll, I'll reach out. Um, and yeah, I look forward to hearing people's input. And thanks again for, for having me. It's a great group. Thank you, thank you. Next up, we have Russell Holmes. He will give us updates. You're up, Russell. I have a question for Cole. Can I just ask for it while um, Rep Holmes is getting his stuff together? Sure, yeah, go ahead. So, so my question is, we have, we have so many um, vacant lots and, you know, lots of, um, you know, we have like this very desirable community and there are many developers that want to come and they want to build and we want to preserve some of this space. Um, so would this uh, community land trust type thing that you're doing be like an opportunity for us to, to, to come together to conversate about how we might be able to retain these spaces and do what we need to have done on them? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, we're actively hoping to acquire a vacant lot, which is um, 357 Park Street in Dorchester. And so we, we are interested in developing on vacant lots. Um, our original model was we formed as a coalition of occupied homes and foreclosure. So mm -hmm. already occupied properties was our main focus, but we're branching out now and we're kind of growing. And um, there's this vacant lot next to one of our properties that we're doing a community process around right now mm -hmm. um, and so it could develop into more than that so this that's like the perfect feedback um, for this because we're trying to develop our strategic plan for the next few years um, so I'll pass along that there's a lot of community interest in uh, vacant lot organizing okay perfect thank you 
Yeah, thank you. Thank you guys. Thank you for that comment. Uh, I'm gonna begin with redistricting. I think we've heard a lot <clears throat> over the last year about all the things with the census. And I think most people in this room know the process, but I'll make sure I do a quick introduction for a moment. So every 10 years we do a census. And then once we get the census, we normally get that census back in uh, April of the year after the 10 years, so 2010. We would normally get it in this April and we would have it done, particularly we would have it done for the legislature by uh, September, November of that year. But this year we got the census late. We're gonna just call it the Trump effect. And um, we, we just finished uh, the new uh, lines. For those who don't know, when we do redistricting or the purpose of redistricting every 10 years is to get the population for the entire state. Then after we get it, the purpose then is to uh, align all the city and all the state reps and city and um, state senators district. And so we have to say, like each one of us, we have about 45,000 people as state reps. The senators have some of the neighborhood of 180,000. And as people move in the state, what we then do is try our best to align that movement. So, sorry for eating, I was just wrapping something up there. Um, so what that meant is in our area, um, there were certain precincts that we had to move. And so if you think about what has happened in the city since over the last 10 years, you would have the major development that has happened over in the waterfront. And you think about all of the people have moved over there. And so as the, the, the state population has grown in Boston, though, there has been a, uh, an allocation that is overweighted, if you think about it, in the South Boston waterfront area. So essentially almost all of us in our roles needed to move north and east to kind of align the population to the movement that happened here in the city. And what that meant was for me, and in Common Square in particular, there was some alignments that needed to happen. I needed to move north and I needed to move east. And so there are some folks in this conversation will be happy with the new alignment and some people won't, depending on if you like my representation or not. But I would say the other thing that happened here is that Representative Liz Malia has retired or is going to retire. And in her retirement, there was a move to say that what we would like to do is to make sure that every single place in this Commonwealth that you can create a majority seat of color, we're gonna try our best to create them. So when I was elected in 2010, there were literally 10 seats that were, when you took the population inside of those seats, that the majority of those people were people of color. In 2000, uh, after the, the last census in 2011, we went from 10 seats that were majority of color across the state to 10 just in Boston alone and 20 across this city. Um, and 10 across the city. and then. Now in this last move, we've gone from uh, 20 to 33 across the state. So mm -hmm. if you think about it, we have moved from 2010 when there were 10 all the way to 33 in just 10 years. And so we believe this creates opportunities in places like Randolph, Brockton, Lawrence, Lowell, in particular Boston, Chelsea. Chelsea is a community that is almost... <laughs> almost all Hispanic, but has not had a Hispanic representation ever. And it was partnered with um, what happens over in Charlestown and the North End. So that district had those two combined. And so when we looked at the reallocation of seats here in Boston, the move was with Rep. Malia retiring, it made sense to realign some of the population. So Rep. Elogato, myself, uh, Fuqua Oakley, we all made some movements, but essentially the seat that was a Boston seat with uh, Rep. Malia leaving has now become a Chelsea seat. So 11th Suffolk, that was the seat that was where um, Franklin Park and all of those places where Rep. Malia used to represent. Much of that seat has been absorbed by either Rep. Elogado, who had some of Brookline, but moved primarily back into Boston. Uh, Rep. Miranda, who moved and took a lot of that seat as well. And then I came up 
uh, from the south a little bit and took some of the seat. And then almost, and I shouldn't say almost, but the seat is essentially only Chelsea. So Chelsea has like 40 some odd people. So we believe just in Chelsea alone, we should have be able to have a person sent there representing the state house that a, a large group of uh, Latinos would send, we think a Latino person. And so uh, the differences here in Cotman Square is in particular, I mean, they're, they're slight, but they're large, meaning the part of Cotman Square today is represented by uh, Representative Hunt. And so when I think about where TNT is, Southern Ave, where Cotman Square NDC is, that uh, district, that part of the district of Cotman Square will now be represented by me. Um, the part of Cotman Square that is represented today by me, uh, which will be where the Cotman Square Health Center is, will be represented by Rep. Uh, Fluka Oakley. She will take Ashmont Hill from me. She'll take um, the area near the Unity Club as well. And so when I think about what used to happen on Washington Street, when you go right down through Cotman Square, um, you would have Rep. Fluka Oakley, then Rep. Holmes, Cotman Square, then Rep. Hunt, then Rep. Miranda, then Rep. Holmes again, then Rep. Miranda again. It now looks a lot simpler. It is solidly Rep. Fluka Oakley, solidly Rep. Holmes from Cotman Square to Four Corners now, basically. Um, and then from Four Corners North will now be um, part of the district on the on the um, hill will be rep uh, representative Miranda. So those changes, even though they are slight, it means I used to not have UNA as a part of the Naval Association, even though I went to their meeting every month, but now I do. It meant that I used to not have West of Washington WOW, but now I do. And essentially almost, essentially all of Rep Hunt is now moved over towards um, Dorchester Ave. Uh, it also means that one of my favorite constituents, uh, Marilyn, is no longer in my now. district. Come on now. <laughs> so Rep. Marilyn is now going to be represented by um, Rep. Uh, Miranda, but what? obviously she's going to always, you can always call me, Marilyn. You can always still beat up on me, but um, the hill and Marilyn, the way it cuts out, the way that that works, I could not believe when I was given up 14-4, that meant they went across the street on Washington Street. I thought it was all just up on the hill on where, on, you know, with Bowden Ave and Rosetta, but somehow it cuts over there. But uh, we believe, um, when we think about just the elected of color, you now literally can walk from uh, Rep. Luke Oakley to Rep. Holmes to Rep. Miranda to Rep. Eligardo to Rep. Tyler to Rep. Uh, Santiago. That center part of, from Mattapan all the way up to the South End, uh, actually going to be represented uh, by people of color. The other thing that happened was on the Senate side, um, 20 years ago or so, uh, when Rep, when Senator uh, Wilkerson was in office, there was an idea and the push at that time to say, well, historically there had been essentially a seat that had been represented by uh, a black person. It had been a seat that was Owens, it had been uh, then Senator Wilkerson, and then so that seat, it was believed that it would, be, it would be more powerful if you would take some of these populations of communities of color and put them into two different seats to see if we could actually have more influence. And those seats, were, that seat was pretty much split. Half of it went with South Boston, which is represented by uh, Senator Collins today. And the other half went with the JP side, which was represented by Senator um, Chang Diaz today. Senator Chang Diaz, as you guys know, is running for governor. And so that again created this opportunity to have another conversation about what really makes sense. And what made sense there was to do something, the inverse of what we had done 20 years ago, and to now say, look, we want, we have no black senators. Can you believe that in, in all of this Commonwealth? And so the thought was, hey, why don't we reconstitute the seat that had historically been a seat that someone of color, a black person had been sending for 20 years. And so if you could think about going straight up Blue Avenue, going down Warren, going down right up to the north, to the south end, what I was just mentioning, that is pretty much the new, which is now the old uh, Senate seat. There's no one in that seat today. Uh, and so it's gonna be a very interesting race, but um, 
uh, those are the biggest things that have happened. So we've gone from 20 seats to 33 of, um, of color. And I guess I said 10 initially from 20 years ago. And we've gone from three opportunity seats in the Senate um, to six. We doubled that. And, it's, and now we've created a seat that is anchored, one with a really uh, Brockton anchor, one with really a Springfield anchor as it had not been before, but a person of color did win that seat. And then one with the Lawrence anchor that has uh, what we believe would be a seat that pretty much guarantees a person of color coming from that area as well. Or certainly if someone not of color, a person who uh, should be aligned with the values uh, of that population. And so I'll take any questions. Marilyn, you can yell at me. It wasn't intentional, but it did happen. Are you any sure? <laughs> oh, I'm sure. I got the map in front of me. And so um, I added the Algonquin area, the Greenbrier area, the Melville, Melville uh, Trimlet area, and, um, and certainly, like I said, um, Southern Ave area. And I had to give up the Unity area, the Rosetta area, and the Ashmont Hill area. Those are the ones that, as we looked at them, for me personally, but obviously I think... Um, one of the, the things that has been, one of the things that's also interesting is uh, Marilyn, um, Rep. Moran is looking to, to run for Senate, for that Senate seat. So that will be a question of if she decides to do that, your rep may be an open seat as well. We'll know that certainly by April. Where can we April. find that? Rep. Holmes. I'll drop, it. I'll drop it in the chat for you right now. Thank you. Any additional questions? If no other questions on redistricting, I have one other thing just to make sure people know. I, I know I went over here, but uh, we uh, embarrassingly, I would say, it's ridiculous that we did this. Uh, we had as a as a state government, the House and Senate. We obviously had gotten some money from the federal fund, the American Recovery Fund, the um, funds that we thought we should have spent. We had about $4 billion that the house, uh, we came to solutions for what we thought should be spent, about $4 billion the Senate felt should be spent. And before we left for winter break, we all anticipated getting that money uh, out to people. What I mean by that is just in the district, 100 grand I was able to get for um, for Sportsman's Tennis Club or you know just all through the district. And, uh, and on all the really challenges of what do we do about trying to get people who have been struggling through COVID, whether that be housing, whether that be our jobs, our businesses, and things of that nature. And we left without the House and Senate coming to an agreement. I will say, um, thankfully, um, there's been a, an agreement by the House and Senate, and we should be able to get those funds out in the next you know, couple of days. And so I know there's been some push around how on earth did we leave without finishing that work. Uh, but we did get it done, and I'm sure we'll probably pass it on the on a voice vote in the next day or two. So, the that's the first wave of that of those funds. The other half of it probably will go out from the neighborhood of April or of May of next year. I'll take any questions if anyone has any. Is it too late for small businesses or constituents to get access to funding? And if not, if not, what do they need to do to apply and to be considered? No, so I wouldn't say it's too late at all. The point of the money is to make it so that those funds are available. So as soon as it's um, released, we, I can tell you one of the, the things I advocated for with small businesses, black and brown businesses in particular, we were saying, how do we get these small businesses money? We had 50 million dedicated. Uh, I put in for 100 million <laughs> and it was still not enough. And they, the Ways and Means group agreed to at least raise it to 60 million. So there is small business money coming and uh, it should have been already released from my perspective. So uh, as soon as the governor signs it, I would say he's gonna sign in the next couple of weeks, uh, you will have access to some of this money for small businesses. Rep Holmes, um, it, would some of that money, would, would uh, uh, some of the work that's going into the, 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 the park, would that be eligible to, for some of that funding? No, so uh, there's another wave of money, as you know, coming. Yeah. Um, and so the infrastructure things, 
<laughs> we intentionally in this way did not do things for parks. Well, I shouldn't say none. We did small things for parks, but um, most of what we would call large infrastructure, parks, capital spending, we're hoping to do with the next wave of money that was just passed by the federal government. We're still spending the first wave of the money, the first $5.4 um, that we had gotten from before, before we get to the next, what we anticipate, uh, six to eight, I mean, eight to 10 billion from the, the latest wave of funding from the Fed. So, um, so this money did not have park money, but the next wave of money should. This is for the park in Common Square or something different? You talking about, right? Yeah, well, for, for the park in Common Square, but also I was thinking, I was talking to Jonna the other day and asked her, I said, you, I told her she should reach out to you because you know that they, they're going to start doing the work on the um, urban wild next to the guild. Oh, sure, sure. Yeah. So, so no, this money, the first wave of money was much more, let us give a half a billion dollars to unemployment to get the unemployment fund. You know, we owe uh, the federal government $2.3 billion from all the people who unfortunately need to do on who, who are unemployed, right? So we need to we, we need to refund that that amount that we've given gotten from the feds. To give you a sense of what we're doing. Six hundred million dollars went to housing, three hundred and fifty million dollars went to climate change and environmental justice issues. Seven hundred and seventy seven million went to economic development, which includes those small businesses. Uh, seven hundred and fifty million went to workforce, but of that five hundred million, like I said, was for unemployment. 765 million with the health and human services. That's all of the COVID related things, um, all the free tests and things that we're doing and 265 million went to education. That was before we put in all the earmarks. And when you say, what's, what are we talking about from, um, from environmental, we're saying a hundred million dollars for water and sewer, you know, things of that nature. So, I mean, I can get you this, this our summary of, of what we're doing is, literally 30 pages, but that was before we put in all the earmarks as well. So finally, we need to release it because it was the money that, it's supposed to be COVID money, we're supposed to be solving issues. The government, the feds gave it to us and we've been fighting with the governor about it for six months. It's about time we release the money, just that simple. And, and so, so it's all been we'll get earmarked, that but, but how does, how does uh, say, how, how would like the NDC apply for, or uh, how do you go about saying, well, can, can we get, or how do you, how does that work? So the so NDC, as you guys did, you advocated for certain line items in the budget. So your normal process for how you get the money would be what you normally do. So Gail and your team. Okay we we'll go through those same line items yep. as normal, but now they will be funded versus before okay. they were not. Thank you. Thank you. Any more questions? All right. We have about 10 minutes. If anyone, any have, anyone has announcements and new businesses, please, this is the time. Any announcements or any new businesses? Um, I just want to also mention that, yeah, we, we're doing the tree lighting for, for Cardman Square on this Saturday. The following Saturday on the 11th of December is going to be the tree lighting at Mother's Rest Park. Um, and that is at four, four o'clock, I believe, on Saturday. So again, you know, just, just come on out and, and participate, be a part of that. There should be some fun stuff going on. Um, there as well. Um, and there Where's that is, park located, Marilyn? It is on, I want to say, four, 400 Washington Street next to uh, Snap Chefs. Um, yeah, in the Four Corners area, right on Washington Street. You can't miss it. It's a big, beautiful tree there too. So, um, you know, it's all part of one long corridor. So, and it's Rep Holmes' new place so yeah rep problems you need to be there too and bring some hot chocolate there too on uh december 11th um yeah <laughs> any other announcements so erica i have a quick update on the uh library renovation okay, project. Right. um so um i know other people from the nbc other people on this call attended a meeting a couple of weeks ago where the library department and the department of neighborhood development were talking about 
the possibility of including housing when they redo the library. Um, so they ran down a lot of statistics of, about, um, uh, you know, housing, rent burdens, people paying too much for rent, um, you know, specific to our neighborhood. Uh, they said that only 11% of the housing in our neighborhood is income restricted, meaning more or less affordable. Uh, and the city average is 19%. So we're, um, you know, we have a deficit by city standards of, um, of affordable housing, as you probably know already. Um, the, uh, they asked people what kind of housing they would like if there are, is housing on the, um, you know, when they redevelop the library. Uh, people said they wanted low income households, they wanted family housing, they wanted uh, intergenerational housing, and they wanted um, elderly housing. Um, in kind of in that order. Um, they talked about trade-offs. Uh, if you include housing, it takes longer to develop the property. There's impacts on parking and traffic, although it's kind of near Ashmont Station. Um, and um, they answered questions about kind of how green the new building would be. Um, if there is housing, the uh, Department of Neighborhood Development has promised um that the housing will be extremely energy efficient it will be so-called net zero uh, they're doing that for all affordable housing and they also recognize that um uh, it's important to reuse as much of the current library as possible because the materials that go into a building have a huge impact on greenhouse gas emissions and the climate which was one of our concerns so that's pretty much the report there will be more meetings. The next meetings they hold will be in general about, um, you know, what's going to be in the um, in the new building um, or what we want in the new building. I think um, it's not in my notes, but I think that people also uh, push them not to, um, you know, not to take away the green space in back of the library um, and, um, you know, to keep um, kind of outdoor space for library users. Thank you, Mike. Is there a meeting coming up soon, Mike? Isn't there a meeting coming up? I am not getting their announcements about meeting dates. So oh. <laughs> I, there probably is. Oh. Good to know, Mike. Okay. Any other announcements? Well, I just have this one last thing to say, I swear, just one last thing. Right? So this, this is it. This is it for 2021. So if I don't see, well, I'm going to see you guys, I know, at one of those tree lightings, but have a happy and safe um end of the year holiday season and there's a new variant out and if you have not received a booster consider getting one um, and just keep yourselves and your family safe just in case i don't see you okay and then bring in the new year like with a new attitude refreshed and thinking healthy for our for yourselves first and then for your family and community thank you marilyn that's a great way to end this meeting Thank you all for joining us tonight. Everyone be safe and have a great night. Night. <laughs>